Right, this is, as I said last week, the last sermon on um, justification by faith. Sometimes I'm as good as my word, and I am this time. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. This is the word of the Lord. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working. Faith working through love. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Have you ever heard of the movement in Christian history known as pietism? That's a uppercase P. I use the word piety here and there in my sermons and teachings, and obviously the two are related, but this is pietism with that capital P. When I use it, it means something like being dutiful in one's religion or being devout in the faith. And while pietism is characterized by those things, when it's capitalized, and this is just Webster speaking, it refers to the 17th century religious movement originating in Germany in reaction to formalism and intellectualism, that is within Lutheranism, by the way, and stressing Bible study and personal religious experience. Or, per Alastair McGrath, at its best, the Pietist movement may be regarded as a reaction on the part of a living faith against the empty formulae of a dead orthodoxy. And once again in context, specifically a dead Lutheran orthodoxy. Sort of ironic, right, because of the role Luther played in basically revolutionizing Christianity in the 16th century. <sighs> It is worth your time to learn about it and to learn from it. There are many commendable things that pietism has left us. Uh, and frankly, we, we have many pietist threads running through evangelicalism, probably more the result of John Wesley and thus on Methodism. And if you think this sounds like a, uh, let's see, a formalism and intellectualism instead of a sermon, you j just wait, we're getting to, but this is part of the background, okay? So Wesley was influenced by the pietists. Wesley, of course, is the father of Methodism, or he's sort of the co-father, and Methodism becomes an extraordinarily powerful movement here in the United States in the 18th century. But I'm bringing it up today to get at a criticism that pietism leveled at Lutheranism. And I turn back to McGrath. Pietism, he tells us, subjected the doctrine of justification to extensive modification. Okay, so they're, they're tampering with the doctrine of justification by faith, 
on the basis of the pastoral concern for personal holiness and devotion. He continues, the concept of imputed righteousness, which is an essential feature for the orthodox understanding of justification, is rejected as being destructive of piety. And McGrath then quotes John Wesley from one of his sermons. Wesley described the teaching that Christ had done as well as suffered all, that his righteousness being imputed to us, we need none of our own, as, quote, a blow at the root of all holiness, all true religion. For wherever this doctrine is cordially received, it leaves no place for holiness. Now, isn't that interesting? The Reformed doctrine of justification by faith alone, relying as it does on Christ's righteousness imputed to those who believe, leaves no place for holiness. And I think, no place for holiness? That's what Wesley said. That's what the pietists seem to believe. And so I... You, you know, I'm not big on being doctrinaire in sort of the front and center way of doing uh, theology and preaching. But I have to say that this is an example of how Arminians so often do their theology. They do it from the ground up. So they look around horizontally at the church at large, they, finding, they find it wanting in one way or another. Perfectly understandable. Many traditions do such a thing. But they turn around and blame what they see as the shortcomings of the Christian church on the doctrine. So... It's a reasoning process that I would say is ultimately grounded in human wisdom and in human perception. It's like the, the classic Calvinistic problem with evangelism. If God is only going to save the elect, why should we evangelize? If righteousness is imputed to us, says Wesley, why try to be righteous? Well, in response to that, I think that Reformed folk, at least when they're on their game, do their theology from heaven downward and really believe that ours is a revealed religion. Or maybe we could say they do it from the scriptures outward so that we're not first taking the temperature of the church or looking at the weather in the church at large, and then doing our theology in response, but with a sincere attempt to, to close off other influences, we desperately desire to hear the word. And in fact, Calvin gives us a perfectly good answer, and I'm going to read it this morning. It's the bookshelf quote. I was particularly struck by it returning to his institutes and continuing uh, this formal and intellectual sermon. But listen to what he says. He speaks very plainly. Why then are we justified by faith? Because by faith we grasp Christ's righteousness by which alone we are reconciled to God. Yet, you could not grasp this without at the same time grasping sanctification also. For he, quote, is given unto us for righteousness, wisdom, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, Christ justifies no one whom he does not at the same time sanctify. These benefits are joined together by an everlasting and indissoluble bond 
so that those whom he illumines by his wisdom he redeems. Those whom he redeems he justifies. Those whom he justifies he sanctifies. But since the question concerns only righteousness and sanctification, let us dwell upon these. Although we may, be, although we may distinguish them, Christ contains both of them inseparably in himself. Do you wish then to attain righteousness in Christ? You must first possess Christ. But you cannot possess him without being made partaker of his sanctification, because he cannot be divided into pieces. Since, therefore, it is solely by expending himself that the Lord gives us these benefits to enjoy, he bestows both of them at the same time, the one never without the other. Thus it is clear how true it is that we are justified not without works, yet not through works, since our sharing in Christ which justifies us, sanctification is just as much included as righteousness. He wrote that, of course, before Pietism and Wesleyanism, but it applies. So the Pietists, with a real concern for holiness in the church, may have simply identified the wrong culprit. And so in that sense, their theology was earthly. The problem that vexed the Pietists and Wesley was not in the doctrine of justification by faith alone, but following the last two or three sermons, the problem was in the so-called faith professed by all these basically unsanctified professing Christians that they saw. Do you see the difference? What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? The implied answer, of course, is no. And James concludes in verse 17, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So James and Paul agree justification by faith is anything but a threat to holiness or to right living or to sanctification or to godliness or whatever word you'd like to choose there. But I wonder if we were to go back in time and get a sense of the perspective they had on their church, if there is one condition for the Christian church that could be perhaps even more dangerous to its spiritual well-being than being a persecuted church, it might be a church that is sponsored by the state. A state church, which was true of Lutheranism in Germany and in the Scandinavian countries, and Wesley himself was ordained as an Anglican minister. So now everybody's a Christian, simply by virtue of citizenship. Do you expect such a church to produce godliness? Where's the problem? It's not in the doctrine. That is a wonderful gift. It's in this thing that we call faith. In our part of the world, when a church places the highest premium on counting converts and filling seats, basically on quantity over quality, where it very easily dead faith passes for the real thing, it will reel in more members. But is it the kind of faith that will justify people on the last day. So while Calvin linked justification to our union with Christ, that's what's behind the quotation, here in our section of Galatians, Paul links it to the work of the Spirit. And that brings me to my first point this morning, which I hope is less formal and intellectual, yet still faithful. 
Galatians 5, 1 through 6, and Christian freedom. Galatians 5, 1 through 6, and Christian freedom. I'm going to read 5 and 6 again, but this time from the New Living Translation. A little bit more accessible, but I think faithful. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Now, the background for those two verses in chapter 5, 1 through 6, is Christian freedom. In chapter 5, verse 1. And Christian freedom in Galatians equals release from slavery under the Sinai Covenant. That's what the yoke is. The yoke is the yoke of the law. Which makes perfect sense in light of what Paul had just said in verses 21 through, well, through the end of the chapter in chapter 4. So chapter 5, 1 follows very naturally on the end of chapter 4. It is not freedom from the yoke of the ceremonial law. That's what the Westminster Confession says. And I think it's made a mistake there. There is no yoke of the ceremonial law. There's only the yoke of the law. Westminster sees it here as the ceremonial law to which the Jewish church was subjected. As if that was the main burden that they were forced to bear. And it cites this text, 5.1, as its source. But in Galatians, Paul's main teaching is the era, the era, the age of the Torah has come to an end. And absolutely in line with the prophets, the era of the Holy Spirit is underway. Indeed, it was already well underway when Paul wrote to the Galatians. And there is a thread in this letter where these two eras are set side by side with the one era being the, the sort of natural consequence of the other, replacing the other. So, famously in chapter 4, 1 through 7, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, we especially Jewish Christians, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time came, see the, this calendar imagery here? The time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And what's the consequence of being redeemed from under the law? Because you were sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. We saw it again in verse 29. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. Two consecutive eras during this era of the Sinai Covenant, a promise was made and repeated that when God came back to his people, the chief blessing that he would grant to them would be his Holy Spirit, a thing unheard of in Israel at large. And that 
age has arrived with Christ and Pentecost, and so that is the time in which we live. And so when we get to verses 5 and 6, based on this idea of Christian freedom, it's not only something of a conclusion to the argument thus far, but like a hinge on a door, right? It, it looks backward, but it also anticipates what's about to come in the rest of chapter 5. And so, through the Spirit, something, well, through the Spirit and by faith, we ourselves wait for the hope of righteousness, the eschatological verdict, that you are justified. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. What counts now then? Faith. Yes, we agree. Faith. Faith. Working. Faith. Working. Working through love. And as it turns out, Christian freedom is not like any of the other freedoms that are out there. It is a Christ-like freedom, and therefore, it is a very ironic freedom. And that brings me to my second point this morning. Christian freedom is the opportunity to enter slavery. Christian freedom frees us to enter into slavery. Luther got this in one of the more well-known statements. It's in his little book, The Freedom of a Christian. He says this, catching the irony, by the way, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And he recognizes the tension within that statement and he develops it. For the same reason I called freedom, Christ-like freedom, for what I hope is the obvious reason that Christ modeled this otherworldly and ultimately divine freedom in his incarnation as it's described perhaps most poignantly in Philippians chapter 2, right? Though Christ possessed the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to hold on to for his own advantage. Instead, he relinquished all of the divine privileges and became incarnate and became incarnate not only as a man but as a slave. Christian freedom is an opportunity to freely enter into slavery and I think the same idea is found in Galatians um, where are we here? Well, first of all, it's found in Galatians 4, 4 through 5, right? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. He entered, he voluntarily entered the slavery in order to redeem the slaves. But it's fleshed out for us here in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but instead, through love, become slaves to one another. You have freedom. What? This doesn't make sense. This needs Christianity, it needs Christ behind it mm -hmm. to give meaning to an absurd statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For you were called to freedom, brothers. High fives all around. Who doesn't want to be free? 
Uh, uh, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity the, through the flesh. Okay, I won't. But use your freedom like this. Through love, become slaves to one another. Oh. And it's right here in verse 14. Where, according to the traditional Protestant way to read Galatians, that Paul should begin finally to teach the church the right and proper way for these Christians to live under the Torah. Right? Because we know that they were misusing the law as a way to earn God's favor and to get into heaven by their good works. Except that's not the problem in Galatia. And we would expect, according to that way of looking at Galatians, that here he's finally ready to straighten them out and to reintroduce the law so they know how to live godly lives. So the conversation should go something like this. Now that I've shown you how hopeless it is to try to earn your way into heaven by law-keeping, it's time for me to show you how you should be using the law for your sanctification. First, and this is important, so you may want to write it down. This is Paul speaking, by the way. Take notes. The law, we know, is divided into three parts. There are the ceremonies, there are the civil laws. Skip that part. You don't have to worry about that. It's the third part, by far the smallest of the three, that concerns you. So pay attention here, because God gave us the perfect rule of righteousness, and it's revealed in 17 verses in Exodus 20, and another 16 verses in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And the Galatians answer, so that, that's it, Paul? What is that, just like 33 verses out of the whole Torah? Paul says, yeah, if you obey that moral law, you'll be on the right sanctification track. But I warn you, don't fall into legalism, because then you'll start obeying that law to earn God's favor, I want you to obey it just as a way of saying thank you to God. But there's nothing like that here or anywhere else in Galatians. In fact, the only law we're told to keep in Galatians is what? The law of Christ. And that's not just a rehashing of the Decalogue. It's how we treat one another. You can see it. It's in uh, Galatians chapter 6. Instead, Paul says this, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. It's summed up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he says. And he uses fulfillment language, which I would say picks up on the language of verse 13. If we could sum up at least how Israelites were to treat one another, that they were to love their neighbor as their self. Here is what it looks like now in the era of the Spirit. You were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another as slaves. Are you following this? This strikes me as exactly the right thing to say to adult Christians, that is, not Christian adults, but those who are mature, no longer under the slavery of the law. Those who are the sons and daughters of God, filled with the Spirit. Does this sound anything like antinomianism? Any antinomianism you've ever heard of? Use your freedom to enter into a slavery characterized by love? Paul's not letting anyone off the moral or ethical hook by putting the Torah 
into the past. He's done the very opposite. People with justifying faith. What did our confession call it? Right? Remember I said a few sermons back, we have to start adding adjectives to the word faith. Adjectives that neither Paul nor James felt necessary because we're trying to distinguish our faith from just faith, the act of believing. So we call it a true and lively faith in the confession. And what Paul says is, people with justifying faith, people with justifying faith, spirit-filled people, are characterized by being Christ-like in their love. And that brings me to my third point this morning. The fruit of the Spirit, or better, the fruit of the eschatological Spirit. That is, the Spirit God would give to His people in the last days. The fruit of the eschatological Spirit. I think I'll preach on this someday, maybe next year. This is just an overview to keep us in the context of justification. But I'm picking up in verse 16 now. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Make your own list. Add to this one. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is, they are not heirs of God. They are not spirit-filled people. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We might expect Paul, if he were a Reformed theologian, to say here, but I say, keep the Ten Commandments, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But nothing in Galatians 1.1 through 5.12 would have prepared us for that. That would have been a dramatic turn an unexpected turn in the letter. No, Paul is convinced that passages like Ezekiel 36 have been fulfilled in Christ and in the gift of the Spirit. And if he is convinced of that, then what he says in 5, 5 through 26 makes perfect sense. Right? You've got to get this point down. Remember, who is the Holy Spirit in Galatians? Just as an example, verse 14, So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. As soon as you attach the word promise to Spirit, you're conjuring up the Old Testament prophets and God's commitment to give His people the Holy Spirit. So just taking a little piece out of Galatians 36, 25 through 28, let me read it to you. Apply it now to the Galatians. Apply it to Paul. 
Apply it to the way he's exhorting the people of God to conduct themselves morally and ethically. Ezekiel, speaking for God, says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And are you listening, pietists and John Wesley? This is one of the most stunning statements in the Old Testament. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I'm going to give you my spirit and I'm going to cause you to obey me. That's a blessing for the sons and daughters of Adam. Well, I'd love to, like I said, take apart this section. I did it in the Bible study. Maybe next year sometime I'll preach on it. But as you think about what Paul just said in verses 16 through 26, doesn't that line up so naturally with Ezekiel 36 and Joel 2 and many other, Jeremiah 31? Was Jeremiah 31 on the cover of the bulletin today? But briefly, first, Gordon Fee provided me with two insights into this section, that is, the section on the fruit of the Spirit. First, it functions as Paul's response to his own question back in chapter 3, a question that he's left unanswered so far. When he says to the Galatians, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now he's saying, here's what it is, not only to begin by the Spirit, but to walk by the Spirit. And what it does. A second insight, and it's one that I make often, but because Fee is way smarter than me, Maybe it'll have a different impact. He writes, quite in contrast to how this material is read by most of us and is presented in many of the commentaries, the concern from beginning to end is with Christian life in community, not with the interior life of the individual Christian. Doesn't that make sense? After Paul has said, use your freedom through love to serve one another as slaves. But now I'm getting back to private Christianity, where the fruit of the Spirit is for your own private enjoyment. Of course he's talking about the church and its community life. You can't become anyone's slave through love if you're detached from the church and focused fully and exclusively on your own personal relationship with the Lord. That's not spirit living, according to Paul and Peter. So remember, at the start, I said the pietists and Wesley blamed a lack of holiness in Christians, or maybe we'd even want to say Christians. They blamed it on justification by faith. And my response to that is, the justification part is not the problem. It's the faith part. That's the culprit. Is there saving faith? So when you take Ezekiel 36 and line it up with Galatians 5, with Galatians uh, 5, 5 through 6, throw in Galatians 5, 13, it just makes so much sense. What did Paul... It, where are you, Paul? Um, for through the Spirit and by faith... We eagerly, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, right? And now, just sort of cherry-picking some of these texts out, listen to the theme here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is Spirit living. And it produces fruit. And it's the kind of Spirit living that follows an authentic, true, and lively faith which apprehends Christ. So here's how Paul reasons this out. The believers are to walk, be led by, live by, and keep in step with the eschatological spirit. That is their part. That is the role they play. That's their side of it. All of which is done by the kind of faith he refers to in chapter 5, verse 5. And when the believers are paying attention to the spirit this way, then the spirit in turn does his part his side of things, producing the fruit that he is so well known for. Namely, love, joy, peace, patience. And of course, not sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, etc. And the analogy is right in front of us. A farmer with fruit trees does not produce the fruit. That's not his part. That's not the role he plays. That's not his side of the work. He prunes the trees. He keeps harmful insects away from the trees. Maybe if there's a frost coming, he keeps the trees as warm as he can. Do you fertilize trees? <coughs> you, we do? Because I just exhausted everything I know about fruit trees. <laughs> Maybe he even fertilizes the tree. But it's the tree's part to produce the actual fruit. Whether it's apples, pears, oranges, figs, love, peace, joy. That's what the spirit, the eschatological spirit, does in the community. And I'm guessing that it doesn't mean every individual fruit is maxed out in every individual believer. But when you take the believing community as a whole, you should find distributed all of these virtues, these fruit, so that collectively they are on display in this glorious orchard of the Lord. So if we collapsed this down, the faith that justifies, that is a faith that lays hold of Christ, per Calvin's treatment, is of a piece with the Spirit's fruit-producing work. And these come together so beautifully earlier in Galatians, where Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when Christ lives in you, we're not saying it's the end of a struggle against sin. It's the presence of the Spirit producing the fruit of the eschatological Spirit. So the Pietists and John Wesley do have good things to teach us, but I think they were in serious error when they questioned the doctrine of justification by faith alone by surveying the church in their day taking its temperature. That was a mistake. This is the amazing grace doctrine. And rather than find fault with the doctrine, they should have questioned and found fault with the faith that led so many non-believers into the church to begin with, whose faith really was a parrot faith. What do you want me to say so that I can become a member here. And I'll say it. No one puts it that crudely, of course, but maybe underneath it all. So rather than find fault with the doctrine, they should have found fault with what was called faith, which was merely a parrot faith. A catechism faith, right? Just parroting what you were taught growing up. Parrot faith frees no one. 
And parrot faith, because it's dead, does not work through love. Rather, it works through the flesh. Parrot faith is more than happy to attend worship services. But it never lays hold of end of the age righteousness. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was sent by you into the world to redeem slaves, slaves to the Torah and slaves to the elementary principles of the world, Jews and Gentiles alike, who had a common father in Adam, and therefore there were no ultimate advantages redemptively. We all needed a second Adam, a faithful, righteous, obedient Adam, who could secure a safe verdict for us at the judgment by himself providing the necessary righteousness. The Christ who lives in us, the Spirit who links us into a union with him. For all of these things, we give you our thanks and praise, and we do pray that as sons and daughters, those who have emerged from the courtroom vindicated, and now those who are adopted into your family, that as Paul exhorted us in chapter 5 of Ephesians, we might walk worthy of the name that we have and seek to do the things that please you, just as ordinary sons and daughters seek to please their parents, that we might be imitators of our Father and of His Son and our older brother, the Lord Jesus. So grant us that privilege so that we maintain the privilege of justification by faith and not dishonor it or slander it by wretched behavior. <clears throat> Grant us this, we pray, and reveal it to us afresh as we come to the Lord's table. For here is where you identify your people in that unique way, and we do pray that by receiving the bread and the wine, we may take the faith that we have and see it reinforced and strengthened. Grant us this, we pray, through Christ alone. Amen. It is no easy thing, nor is it a small task, to talk to individual believers about the credibility of their profession of faith. I can't see anybody's heart. George can't either, nor can Dr. Brooks, the three of us as elders. And so we look for credibility. But ultimately, credibility is a thing that's tested over time. And so I've gone back and forth over the many years, sometimes becoming stricter, sometimes becoming more generous, because one person may have parrot faith and can just imitate everything he or she has been taught. Another person may have simple but genuine faith and can barely articulate much more than, I've trusted in Jesus Christ for my salvation. How do you discern? Mm. Some people could come in and lecture me on the doctrine of the resurrection and may not have genuine faith. While another person may not know what the doctrine of the resurrection means, but they do know that they've trusted in Christ as their righteousness and salvation. And all of these things are tested over time. And so, strictly speaking, the Lord's Supper is a privilege for those who not only have been baptized, 
but have made their profession of faith in the church. So that the church, as freely as it can, in the distribution of the elements, say to those people, we recognize you as a Christian. In practice, this gets pretty muddled. But that explains why week by week, I do what's known as fencing the table. And so in that sense, I put it back on you. Are you Christians? If you're visiting with us and we don't know you, are you Christians? If you've been here for a while and you haven't made a profession of faith, are you Christians? Because this is a meal that Jesus shares with his devoted, committed followers. And we don't know who you are. All of this is my way of saying that justifying faith is a treasure. And the church has a role to play in confirming believers in that faith, but it is a limited role, limited by our own ability to judge and perceive. And so this is the table that the Lord sets for his true people, and he loves to share a meal with them, his body and his blood. But if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you do not recognize anything of yourself in what I've just preached on either this Sunday or in the previous, then maybe don't come to the Lord's table this morning, but come to speak to me or to one of the elders to find out, am I a Christian? And what exactly does that mean? But to the rest of you, here is the righteousness of Christ provided in his extraordinary obedience by dying as a mocked slave on a cross in order that he might restore us to God. Let's enjoy him and celebrate his great name by receiving the bread and the wine with faith.